Hi, and welcome to Kidney Plugged In in 2023. In this January, we continue our very special interview with Patricia and her daughter, Charlotte Crowley. Patricia's late husband, Russell Crowley, was diagnosed with kidney disease at the age of 17 and began a journey that took him through several stages of dialysis before becoming only the third transplant recipient in BC in 1967. This was at a time when information on kidney disease and transplantation was hard to find and support organizations were not yet in existence. Russell Crowley was determined to make a positive change. In part two of our interview, Patricia and Charlotte share the story of a family legacy that had laid dormant for over 50 years until a series of serendipitous circumstances led to the rediscovery of a treasure trove of documentation, revealing the founding members of the BC and Yukon branch of the Kidney Foundation. So stay with us, because Patricia and Charlotte join us again, next, right here on Kidney Plugged In. Previously on Kidney Plugged In. Pat and Charlotte, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the show because you have a really interesting story. I've been running a program called Yoga on the Beach in Parksville. We charge just enough to cover our costs and it's become a major fundraiser. So a large portion of our income goes to donation for various organizations. And every year we pick a different one to support. My dad had had the third transplant at Vancouver General in the, in the 60s. I thought, why don't I honor my dad and make that our charity? I contacted the Kidney Foundation. They got back to me and said, wow, this is cool. Your dad was involved in the early days. What a great story. And when I told my mom, she's like, well, I have a box full of information. She's been hauling around this file box for 60 years. Good, good 60 years. She opens up the box. It's full of documents from those days, letters, newspaper clippings, notes that she'd made, diaries that she made about how she felt during those days. It was like a treasure trove. And so in April, after the class, one of the people that had come, who happens to be my neighbor across the road, he comes over and he says, hey, my father, was involved in the original kidney transplant team in Vancouver in the early days. And it's like, wow, that is cool. His father is Dr. Ralph Christensen. And he contacts his dad and says, hey, my neighbor, here's the story. He comes back and he says, well, myself and Dr. Maloney did your dad's transplant. And then I'm like, oh my goodness. What it took for the universe to pull us together. I could just see the universe going, oh, for heaven's sakes, we got you this close. Let us get you together. And I was <laughs> totally sort of a mad. I, I don't know, just I haven't got a word for it. Since we opened up that box, my mom has really gone down memory lane. His name was Russell Lawrence Crowley, and he was kind of a good-looking guy. He was the floor manager at a hardware store. It probably started at the age of 17 when he was diagnosed with nephritis. Although they thought he was okay, it gradually came back. We were having a really good marriage. We had three wonderful children. He began to be not feeling well. They took him into the renal unit, which became a new word to me very quickly, off a word. I admit it, I used to cry a lot. He'd be at the hospital going through dialysis, and there I was in this big new bed all by myself. And there were a lot of feelings around that too. Of the three kids, the boy, Richard, in a way suffered the most. I went to put him to bed one night, and Russ was still on dialysis, and he said, does my daddy ever come home? I miss my daddy. And I broke into tears. <laughs> you can't explain to a four or five year old that maybe yeah. he's not coming home. A few years before the transplant, I just didn't know how I was gonna keep on going. So in total, how many years was Russell on dialysis? 65 to 69, four years. At that time, there were no living donors. It always had to be someone who had passed away. The match had to be made, permission had to be given, and the kidney had to last until it got to the recipient. It was a pretty tight time frame. They had uh, two different times for the same operation. It wasn't suitable by the time it got to him. I know my dad waited for one and two, and then finally the third one worked. He was having it, and they assured me that it would work. I was happy and glad and relieved. He freely was happy and you know, now I can get on with life. I know that Russ, 
tried to be a help to others, even when he was sick. He was always there for someone. If they needed something or if they needed something he could provide, he would, and he would try. I think his attitude kept him going until he'd had the transplant, and that, that, was, that was his goal. Let's see, so kidney is a... These are my grandpa's kidney stones. They're very precious. Kidney is a bone in your back that helps you turn. <laughs> mm, I don't know, to be honest. They don't know kidneys are vital, do you? Get the facts at kidney.ca. During the time that Patricia's late husband, Russell, was on dialysis, he continued to connect with other kidney patients who were going through a similar journey. But like Russell, they found that they had limited access to resources to guide them. Russell decided to do something about that. And together with a small group of kidney patients, he became one of the founders of a support organization in BC called the Kidney Foundation. Well, it turned out that the people on dialysis in the Vancouver renal unit got to know each other so well because there would be more than one having a treatment at the time, especially the women. Like, we had trouble with a diet in those days because he couldn't have potatoes and he couldn't have milk and he couldn't and have salt and he couldn't have salt and here I am with all this other stuff going on and trying to make a meal for him and uh, we were talking one day amongst the patients and a few of the wives or husbands that came in and said well you know why don't we get together some night and we'll make a little list of stuff you know and that kind of thing talk we put it together. And there were really just four people to start. And then after Russ got his transplant, we kind of backed away from the renal unit. And um, they had this group then. And then it sort of became this thing. So this is a, the front says the kidney foundation. I don't know if you can see it there. And then inside, so this is a little typed hand, like my mom typed this. And it's- Oh my goodness. This is the founding document actual original of the kidney foundation and it says the aims and function of the foundation are in this pamphlet to assist you as a new member to our group and they had seven directors they had a lawyer a physician a social worker and three patients and one i believe it was a wife i think now i i did not know about this this comes out of the box i look at it and i'm going oh my goodness our executive consists of President Russell Crowley. First vice and second vice are two patients, Fred Burns and Rudy Heggie, who I do remember the names, and secretary treasurer was Pat Crowley. And then they had the aims. I mean, this is very professionally done. It, it was a, like a foundation document. It's 1967. <laughs> it's been yeah. sitting in this box for like 60 years. It's history, absolute history. It was something that Russ wanted to do because he was great at helping some of the other patients. He'd be in for his treatment, and in the meantime, in the next bed, another guy's having a treatment. You know, he wanted to help. He was that kind of guy. Possibly without this group, the, the foundation yeah. right, wouldn't exist, certainly wouldn't be what it is today. Yeah. It was so amazing, just, I guess, but I didn't even remember that it was in. I think I knew right away. I just felt, I thought, this is, this is a treasure. <laughs> this is a founding document. This is an original. This, <laughs> this would be in a museum under glass if it was a piece of art. I mean, it was, <laughs> I, I just, no. uh, mouth jaw dropping. And the only original, it, it, it is it. This is it. And from here, the whole thing went forward. And I know from talking to mom through this whole box explosion of documents, 
flood. They did not have any idea of the potential really because they were so focused on helping each other and finding a way of giving people support. But I have to say that looking at this document, I think they must have felt like there was a future for this. And what a legacy oh. it's turned out to be. Yeah. So was it Russell's nephrologist at EGH at that time, Dr. John Price, who initially provided encouragement and guidance to the idea of a patient support group? He helped the group get together just by, by being in the background. He was sort of like a director and stuff. He encouraged them, but he didn't do anything about it. He let them talk, but it was not his move to do that. He didn't suggest that they have a helpful group or anything. If they wanted to do that, he would be backing them up. So essentially, the origin of the Kidney Foundation here in BC was actually a small group of patients helping patients. And as you say, none of you could have ever predicted the far-reaching positive impact that your actions would continue to make for kidney patients and their caregiver over half a century later. Chong, Manager of Patient Services for the Kidney Foundation, and this is Did You Know? Did you know that many people are unaware of the programs and services designed to support kidney patients and their caregivers here in British Columbia? Our short-term financial assistance program is in place to provide financial support to kidney patients at a time of crisis or when there has been an unexpected expense. The Kidney Foundation recognizes that many of the expenses associated with kidney disease are borne directly by patients and their families, and that often financial hardships is an additional stressor in their lives. Renal social workers may apply for grants for their low-income patients for unexpected household expenses, extraordinary travel, and other pressing needs. Any patient in BC or the Yukon who needs a kidney transplant must travel to Vancouver for transplant surgery and recovery. This usually entails remaining in Vancouver for about two months post-surgery. In order to support these patients, the BC and Yukon branch has established seven kidney suites. These fully furnished units are free for eight weeks for low-income patients and just $35 per night for those above the financial threshold. We have made sure to offer accommodation for a variety of demographics. There's a three bedroom townhouse for families, a child friendly two bedroom near the St. Paul's Transplant Hospital, and even a suite that caters to the most senior population. Our branch offers a number of brochures and manuals that are available for free. Most popular are the living with reduced kidney function and living with kidney failure, often distributed to kidney patients through the kidney care clinics. They're also available to individuals. Kidney patients and their caregivers can always call the patient services department and chat with a staff member who can answer their kidney related questions. Although staff are not providing medical advice, they are there to assist patients with questions about their kidney diagnosis, diet related questions, to explain lab test results, and to direct callers to other appropriate resources. Kidney Connect is a telephone-based peer support program available to all kidney patients and their caregivers. People can request to be matched with a trained peer support to discuss a variety of topics from dialysis choices to lifestyle issues to concerns about being newly diagnosed. The Kidney Foundation supports organ donation. To this end, we provide a reimbursement program for anyone who decides to be a living donor, kidney donor, or a liver donor. LODERP stands for Living Organ Donor Expense Reimbursement Program and aims to ensure that there is no financial barrier to being a living donor. Transplant social workers can provide more information and forms to candidates or living donors can contact us directly. Another way that we support living donors is through our Living Donor Mentor Program. 13 trained supporters who have been living kidney donors themselves are standing by and waiting to talk to any potential living kidney donor who may have questions about the process. All demographics are covered as we've trained both women and men of all ages and geographical locations. Some who have been anonymous donors, some who have donated to their children, parents, and some who've donated to a specific friend. 
each summer, the branch provides a summer camp opportunity for young kidney patients. All camp fees are covered by us and children from all over BC and Yukon can enjoy a week of fun activities at Camp Latona on Gambier Island. We recognize the importance for children to spend time with others with similar kidney issues in a safe camp environment supported by nursing staff at BC Children's Hospital. Currently, the branch is offering four pilot initiatives that will be evaluated at the end of 2021 or mid-2022. We very much support patients who want to train to do home dialysis therapies and believe that there should be no financial burden to deter them. To this end, we offer the Northern Travel Pilot Program designed to cover accommodation and travel costs for those in Northern BC who need to travel to Prince George. All patients are eligible. There is no financial criteria. Similarly, we support kidney patients from Vancouver Island who need to travel to Nanaimo for home dialysis or peritoneal dialysis training by offering the kidney condo a fully furnished two bedroom apartment close to the hospital. Again, there's no financial assessment for a stay here and this residence is booked through a renal social worker. Many patients who are being assessed for a kidney transplant find themselves in a position where they may not move ahead with the process until they have a clean bill of health from their dentist. Unfortunately, some patients are unable to fulfill this requirement due to finances. We believe that no patient should be denied a transplant because they are low income. Consequently, we offer the Dental Pilot Initiative, whereby we will pay dentists directly for work done on qualifying kidney patients. And lastly, in collaboration with BC Renal, the Blood Pressure Monitor Initiative was developed. Any low-income patient who is affiliated with a kidney care clinic here in BC can access a free home blood pressure monitor as the importance of home monitoring is recognized by all. We are here to help. Please reach out to us directly with any questions or speak to your social worker. And now you know. Hey honey, I lost the list for Jason's birthday thing. Obviously hamburger, cakes. <laughs> no, not hamburger cakes. Hamburgers and cake. <laughs> <laughs> and buns, uh, sausage. Talking. Ooh, eye candy. Is it a full moon tonight? People are being... Weird. And uh, don't forget to make the Facebook event private this time. Okay, bye. <gasps> Can you imagine losing most of something without realizing it? Over time, kidney disease can destroy up to 80% of kidney function before you notice any symptoms. Talk to your family doctor to see if you're at risk and need to be screened. It could save your life. Patricia and her late husband and kidney patient, Russell Crowley, were two of a small group of individuals who, over 60 years ago, saw a desperate need for more information and support to be made available for kidney patients. So they came together, took matters into their own hands, took action, and created what became the original BC branch of the Kidney Foundation. And over the years, countless numbers of kidney patients and their families have reaped the benefits from this small group of kidney kidney patients with a vision. But back then, the knowledge of what kidney patients were going through and an understanding of kidney disease was very different. I used to write letters to myself because in those days there was nobody to go to and there was nobody that knew enough to know that you needed help. I was lucky in a couple of very, very good friends and one was my boss. He was like a brother. He was a true friend, and this friend, Martha, she just knew how to lift everybody. She spent a lot of time at our house. I was so busy trying to cope, finding out that there really were people that you wanted to depend on, just didn't know, because people didn't know. I, I have to say that what I've seen since we opened up that box is my mom has really gone down memory lane and a lot of feelings and emotions are coming up and a lot of things that she's still carrying around. Yeah, that's true. Um, 
and she spent a lot of time looking through things and remembering and reading her letters and it's been a quite an emotional journey and and also for me a big part of my life it was you know yeah and you were a young mom yeah my mom I think was 39 when my dad passed away yeah and when I think back to then 39 yep they didn't even get going <laughs> I mean they, that's right they were they were just not even in their middle ages they were they were young in fact the older I've gotten and when I've come up to that point because when I was young he was old I was a kid yeah then I got closer yeah. into my 40s and I'm like geez my dad was young and then I got over past 40 and older and I'm incredibly sad because I'm realizing how young he was and how young my mom was. So Russell was in his late 30s when he received his kidney transplant. At that time he was only the third kidney transplant recipient in all of BC. Is that something that Russell took pride in? He did. He felt wonderful. He freely was happy and you know now I can get on with life. And uh, that lasted about a year and a half. And he gradually kind of got sick again. He started to bloat here in his stomach and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And I thought, oh, no, not again. I always remember as a kid that it was Christmas time and he felt really ill, but we didn't know he did. He lasted right through Christmas. And I think it was the, the next day, maybe Boxing Day. He said, I have to go to the hospital but he kept going right up until that day because he wanted us all to have Christmas. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, he died in early January, so. January. Something. That was your last Christmas together as a family. Christmas together, and he was so strong and determined that I knew, I knew even as a kid that he went as far as he could go. Yeah. He was done, so. Yeah, there was no other thing they could do. One last Christmas together as a family. That's beautiful. But his legacy lives on. Oh. I, I appreciate everybody that has found out about our history box, <laughs> as Charlotte calls it. I appreciate that something like this has come from all the effort that the family and the doctors and stuff, the whole group went through. It was pretty rugged. I missed things like going on family camping, things during the summer and the, the normal things. It's almost hard to fathom the, the impact, I think. When you look at that little founding document and you learn about how it was then and to see and hear now how it's blossomed into this huge organization with all this phenomenal support and know that my parents, even going through what they went through and suffering from not having what now is available, that they somehow got it together <laughs> to support each other. And then I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm very proud and I'm, it's, it's hard. hard to put it into words, really, yeah, because you sacrificed a lot for it, really, mm -hmm. and would have preferred not to go through it. But it just shows the kind of people that they were and how yeah. strong they were and how resilient they were and how caring they were for other people. So my heart's pretty full about this, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it is. Russ would have been proud to know that everything he went through, he's left a pattern. So that one day, we won't have to live with this disease, and one day there will be a cure. Thank you both for taking the time to share the story of your family's journey with kidney disease and Russell's legacy in being part of this small visionary group of founding members of the BC Grant to the Kidney Foundation. A group whose actions epitomize the famous quote by Margaret Mead, Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has.
Did you know one organ donor can save up to eight lives? You're more likely to need a transplant than you are to become an organ donor. Donation is considered only after all life-saving efforts are made, and it's certain you will not survive. So two physicians who are independent of both the donation program and of the transplant program must declare an individual neurologically dead before organ donation can proceed. Any British Columbian who is 19 or older can register their decision about organ donation and parents can register their children. You only need to register your decision once. A decal on your driver's license or care card is no longer enough. Register or verify your decision about organ donation at transplant.bc.ca. And now you know. And now you know. And now you know. And now you know. Life can be unpredictable. Anything from a flood, wildfire, earthquake, or even a pandemic may affect the availability of dialysis services. Being prepared can save your life. Don't wait until an emergency happens. Take the steps to be ready now. Have your copy of the Emergency Preparedness Information for Dialysis Patients booklet on hand and keep it updated with your personal information. Keep a list of your current medications with you and always have at least three days supply on hand. Make an emergency pack. It should last 72 hours. Carry a BC Renal Emergency Wallet card with you. After a disaster strikes, follow these rules to stay safe. Stay at home if you can. If you are hurt, go to a hospital. Begin the emergency renal diet. Wait for instructions. Keep radio, TV, and phone on if possible. Dialysis patients should be prepared to have dialysis day or night or at another dialysis unit. Need help? Go to bcrenal.ca, health info, emergency preparedness to get started. Download important documents you will need in the event of a disaster. Get prepared. It can save your life. You have so many memories together. Summer road trips, driving lessons, and noisy carpools to soccer. Saying goodbye can be a little emotional. When you know it's time, Kidney Car is the fast, feel-good answer you're looking for. Avoid the hassle. We take care of it all. From towing to recycling or even resale, Kidney Car is something the whole family can agree on. Feel great knowing you've made the difference in the lives of Canadians living with kidney disease. Donate at kidneycar.ca. Charlotte, welcome to Plugged In. You're joining us today from Parksville on Vancouver Island. Lovely to be here. Thank you. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> the intro. So when your husband was first diagnosed with kidney disease, it was nephritis that he was diagnosed with? Oh, no. <laughs> 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 That's a great blooper. 